Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Richard Tang, CEO of Zen Internet. And what has Zen Internet and a bank got in common? Well, when that bank is Triados Bank, we're both part of the B Corp movement. And to talk about B Corp and lots of other things, I'm delighted to welcome Bevis Watts, CEO of Triados Bank UK. Very warm welcome to our HQ in Rochdale, Bevis. Thanks, Richard. Nice to be here again. The B Corp movement. So some of the people watching might never have heard of B Corp. What's it all about from your perspective and from Triados's perspective? Well, Triados was one of the original B Corps and it stands for Best Beneficial Corporation. So it's essentially trying to holistically measure the social and environmental impact of companies and, and show that you know they, they can actually be a force for good. So um, it's, it, there's a minimum threshold that you have to qualify on around, uh, I think it's around 90 points. Uh, and then they will rate companies worldwide and, and some of them will be best in class on different categories. So we're actually um, rating best in the world on our governance and we have an overall score of, a, as a B Corp, around 134, which would be very high. Um, but really, it's, it's partly about a journey as well. So in terms of who we finance, we are interested in people becoming a B Corp and then telling us, well, how will you improve over time? Uh, and then how can we finance you and help with that transition? So. Yeah, I mean, what we found at Zen, when we became a B Corp, it was so well aligned to our values anyway, this idea of, you know, there's something a bit, and in fact, the founders of B Corp in, in the States said, there's something a bit wrong with the way that business works. Mm -hmm. It's all this focus about money as being the ultimate end goal. What about people? What about environment? You know, what about the local community? Yeah. Um, and so they set up this structure where you've got to write into your articles of association a responsibility for the directors to take on a par with making financial returns you've got the environment you've got your employees you've got your customers you've got the local community you know all these stakeholders should have equal weight yeah um and to make that actually a a legal responsibility of the directors fitted really well into what we were doing at zen and and, and i guess is is a real thing that sets Triados apart from the the banking community at large. Yeah. I, well, I can imagine um, it wasn't a big transition for you to write that into your articles of association, but for, for some companies it is. And Triados was actually set up on that premise originally. It originally started in the Netherlands and was conceived in the late 70s and has been a bank since 1980. But with that ethos that we're here to sort of um, deliver that triple bottom line and really think about how do we create a better quality of life for people today without compromising the quality of life of future generations or the natural environment. That's essentially why we, uh, why we exist. Yeah, it's a reflection on, uh, I guess, views that, that I've shared on about the world of business, capitalism in general, um, and, and, and the need for a more sustainable future. I mean, again, that's something that I know we're really well aligned on. Uh, the B Corp movement itself, it seems to be really growing quickly. I mean, looking at the numbers mm -hmm. um, today, there are about 7,000 B Corps worldwide, about 1,300 of those are in the UK, Yeah, I think. And the, the UK, when I looked uh, maybe a couple of years ago, that was more like 300. So yeah, it no. seems to be a movement that's really taking hold yeah uh, yeah and well i mean you hope it in a way it almost becomes the norm in time yeah. and you know what i hope is be caught continue as people have to sort of recertify um they continue to actually raise the standards over time of what it takes to get a certain score yeah uh and i think that's really important so the kind of front-running businesses or people like you who are leaders in your sector continue to get that differentiation you know it's not just a, a tick box as it were um so i'd actually quite like to see b corp publish the score alongside the logo so you get to use certified b corp but your number appears below it as well because yeah. that would incentivize people to continue to drive change Definitely. And it's definitely something that, you know, once you've got the certification, there's that desire to sort of say, okay, this year, how can we get more points? So yeah. it's, it's a good system from that point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and certainly gets our focus. So one thing that, that there are many things that set Triados apart from other banks. One of the things that sets it apart is you've got to pay for your current account. <laughs> you've got to pay three pounds a month when you can get a free current account from... Yeah all the major banks. 
So how can you justify charging your customers three pounds a month for something that's free pretty much everywhere else? Yeah, or you think it's free pretty much everywhere else. So um, I suppose it's a, it's a serious question, but I'm asked it a lot, so uh, hence my chuckle. And, uh, and ultimately, we're a bit of a strange banking market. Free banking was something that started in the UK in about 19, in the 80s with, uh, with Midland Bank. And um, if you look at other European countries, it's common that people will play a sort of minimum, you know, five, seven euros uh, as a standard charge on their account. And that's because it, it, it's not something that banks run for free. You get a piece of plastic that gives you money out the hole in the wall. You get uh, your access to internet banking, your mobile app, all of these things that are expensive to run. Uh, and so the charge is, is a contribution to that. Now, um, historically, banks have paid for that through charging through indirect means. And there was a report by the Competition and Markets Authority in 2016, which showed that many banks had been charging more than double the rate of payday lenders for unauthorized overdrafts. Well, if you think about who typically uses unauthorized overdrafts, it's the people who are most uh, struggling to manage their finances in our society, the most vulnerable. So there was a one and a half billion a year kind of um, penalty, if you like, on the people who are most struggling, which we didn't think was right. So when we launched our current account in 2017, it's a three pound a month fee, which we kind of think for most people is a cappuccino a month uh, to basically say we're not going to follow that model um, and uh, we're going to offer fair and transparent charging across the piece so you understand what you're you know, paying for or not. Otherwise, at the minute, we still have a society really where the wealthy pay the least for their banking services and that, that doesn't seem right to me. Um, and whilst the Financial um, Conduct Authority acted to, to kind of um, uh, inhibit that practice, I suspect most people don't realise, because the majority of people don't use them regularly, but um, if you look at what you're paying on your overdraft, I suspect it's around 40% will be the standard terms most banks offer. So all they did was increase the rate on standard overdrafts, which potentially just locks more people into debt when they do dip into overdrafts and so on. So, um, so long answer, but it's a really important issue and it gets to the heart of how banks should behave and, and having really fair and equal banking for all. I think it's back to this bigger question of you know, the responsibility that businesses have to their customers and the, the community as a whole, society as a whole, yeah. I, I guess. And I am obviously a personal customer of Triodos Bank. I pay my three pounds very happily every month. And I, 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 I've said a few times that actually, from my point of view, that is really good value because I sort of think that if all banks had been B Corps, have, had operated like Triodos, in 2008, the financial crisis just would never have happened mm. because that sort of behavior that was endemic in the banking sector that led to the crash and the financial crisis just wouldn't have happened if banks had operated within the ethical constraints that Triodos, I assume, operates under. I mean, yeah. would, well, would you say that's... Well, I, th I think that's right. I mean, our banking model uh, essentially is one where we, we only lend a proportion of the funds entrusted to us. So we aren't highly leveraging, uh, you know, our, our balance sheet and, and borrowing from others and, and, and so on. So uh, ultimately, that was part of the frailty that caused the financial crisis. Also, the risk being taken on subprime mortgages and, you know, things that essentially were seen as safe because there were lots of them and they all couldn't fail when inherently every one of them was very... Uh, high risk and so on. But I mean, uh, ultimately, I think the basis on which, you know, we're founded is, as you say, it's, it's about putting society and our customers at the heart of every decision that, that we're trying to make in how we run our business, in what we finance and in how we, you know, uh, support and, tra and transact with our customers. So, for example, we don't offer any performance related pay um, because we think that's incentivized the wrong kind of behaviors. So um, we want people to come and work for the bank because, you know, they believe in trying to have a positive positive impact on the world and want to try and prove there's a different kind of bank and uh, and be part of that. Um, yeah, so, uh, but it, 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 it cuts through every sinew uh, yeah. and every decision you make in every aspect of your supply and, and decisioning. Yeah. Interestingly, we don't offer any performance related pay either at Zen, which is completely at odds with the rest of the industry. Yeah. And look, I'm going to do another vlog about 
performance related pay, but not this one. Um, <laughs> back to the three pounds a month for my account and, and back to the financial crisis. I, I did a little calculation. So I looked at national debt and look, national debt went from half a trillion to about one and a half trillion between pounds between about 2006 and 2015. Mm -hmm mostly as a result of the financial crisis, so like one trillion pounds increase in, bet, in debt. And I thought, how many people are there in the UK? About 68 million. So for every single person in the UK, including newborn babies, kids, everyone, that's 15,000 pounds worth of debt mm. per person in the UK. And yeah. I'm thinking the cost of repaying that over many, many years is going to be a lot more than... Yeah, three pounds a month. So there's my just there's one of my yeah. justifications yeah. for banking with you guys. Yeah, well, I, I, and thank you for doing so, and all our customers who sort of kind of believe in what it is we're trying to do. Um, ultimately, we also try and be a thought leader to say, well, what needs to change around us? Because you know we we are, are, are a growing bank and becoming an increasing sort of part of the debate on what banking should be. But um, but yeah, we, we, we've, um, we launched a campaign actually during the pandemic called Reset the Economy that was really trying to call to, to rethink how this works and that we shouldn't just be measuring the success of our economy on GDP, mm. which is a measure of how much we spend and therefore how much we consume. You know, we should be thinking more holistically around people's well-being, you know, and uh, the quality of the natural environment. And um, uh, and so, you know, we, we very much try and promote the donut economic theory, which Kay Rateworth, uh, Kate Rateworth, sorry, uh, uh, authored a great book on and I'd recommend to people, yeah. It's an interesting thing about this GDP growth. You know, the, most of the world are obsessed with GDP growth. And of course, they can point to improvement in well being linked to GDP growth. But people just assume it's unlimited. Mm. And if, look, if the world had unlimited resources, then maybe that model would be okay. But it's really clear yeah. that the world hasn't got unlimited resources. Yeah. Um, and so if we just keep spending more and more and more and consuming more and more and more, well, I mean, we, we, yeah. we could spend a whole other vlog talking about all that, which yeah. we won't do, but obviously a big issue. Uh, let's, let, let's move on. I want to move on to um, a couple of things on sustainability, net zero. Mm. So Triodos is net zero target 2035 yeah. to be net zero. I mean, what... what I know from Zen's perspective, the challenge of becoming net zero, um, particularly when it comes to scope three emissions, is huge. Mm. What, what about Triodos? Where are you? Well, different industries have different challenges. And um, when I say that we want to be net zero by 2035 at the latest, a lot of people are surprised by that because we've been renowned for 40 odd years as a pioneer in sustainability and had very high practices. We've never financed fossil fuels or any high emitting sectors. So they're kind of like, well, why will it take until 2035? And, and we've been saying very honestly, because even for us, it's hugely difficult. And so a lot of people that say we're going to be net zero by 2050 and so on, it all sounds great, but I actually think it's very hollow because they might not yet have a really robust understanding of their baseline, let alone what that transition journey mm. to being net zero means. And, and for us, as a bank, the, the science-based target initiative guidelines means that your scope three emissions are everything you finance. So we have to take responsibility for the emissions of everything that we finance, every company and organization. Wow. So, um, and you can see we've, we've published for many years and have pioneered a methodology that's now the kind of global best practice standard of how you measure emissions in financial portfolios. Um, but, but ultimately, um, it, it shows that we're still emitting um, because we finance housing associations and care homes and things that will still have significant emissions associated with them. So for us, it means taking responsibility for the part of the portfolio that will sequester carbon. So much greater interests in regenerative agriculture, sustainable forestry, rewilding. So we've been working since 2018 to really try and invest and grow our interests in that, which is starting to take off. But, um, but I think us saying, look, we think this is really hard and we can't get it until 2035, we'll try and get there earlier, should be a kind of alarm bell to the industry that this, this is uh, really difficult and we need to see much, much faster and more concerted action uh, in government policy trying to, to change um, uh, our whole sort of economic paradigm. Wow, what a challenge. Everything that you invest, and, and, and look, I think for Zen, we've got a target of 2040, but we've got an equally gargantuan challenge mm. in terms of 
you know, everything, the whole of the internet, the upstream, downstream, the supply of routers, the raw materials, to, um, all the power. Yeah. Uh, and of course, a lot of that is, is outside of our control. We're trying to work with the rest of the industry to try and get a joined up view of that. Mm. But the, the, the issue is, is enormous. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and it's, it's, um, Again, you know, bringing it back to customers, it's partly about you, you know how are you helping uh, people on that that transition. So, for, so for us, we have to think for our uh, the people who bank with us. Then, how are we helping to give you advice and potentially products in the future that help with your own transition? How do we help people who borrow from us, and how do we assess them into the future? How they will improve. Also, where are companies like Zen and Triodos trying to provide thought leadership to influence government yeah. policy and say, well, actually, this is impossible without uh, the following things. And um, uh, so th there's a whole wealth of stuff that we need to do and work collaboratively on. I noticed that uh, an organization called Mother Tree came up with the Carbon Bank League table. What they'd assessed is how many tons of CO2 are emitted per £10,000 in an account. Mm. And Triodos were the best performing of that entire league table of 16 yeah. uh, with 0.317. Worst was Barclays. <laughs> and so, I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that? And, and, and I suppose what the industry needs, yep. you know, what the banking industry needs to do. Well, I mean, you guys. <laughs> we're very pleased that, that, that Mother Tree decided to produce that league table. And I know they're committed to continuing reviewing and refining methodology and base it on what's publicly available or they can interpret from all banks' accounts. But I mean, I, I, we weren't surprised, although we were very pleased to come bottom of that league table with the lowest net emissions. Bottom being the best. Yeah, exactly. Bottom being the best. It's the one league table you want to come bottom of. But you know, we, we shouldn't be complacent. As I was saying, what that means is we've still got some way to go. We are still a bank that has emissions uh, associated with what we do. But, um, but you know, you, you mentioned one of the big four high street banks in the UK. They're one of the biggest global financiers of fossil fuels. So it's not a surprise that they're very high at the top. But I think this is a start. In, we need to bring much greater transparency mm. to sort of, you know, consumers in terms of what it is they're really getting from yeah. their banks. And you talked about the three pound fee earlier. One of the things we commit is that we will publish every loan and investment that we make worldwide. So you can be the judge of whether we're getting it right. And if you don't like something, you don't get that transparency from other banks. Um, increasingly, everybody's now starting to publish their emissions, but we've done this really since 2016 was our first uh, attempt at doing it. And then we've published in full all our scope three emissions since 2019, I think. So uh, so some banks are still yet to do that. So, so the more we can bring transparency, because I'm sure Zen is the same. I'm sure you're in a world where most people just compare you uh, on price comparison sites, just on price. Um, whereas service quality matters, where emissions and environmental footprint and social responsibility matter. And, uh, and that's where I think B Corp can play a role. But ultimately, I think we need also much greater in-depth and insight from some of those consumer comparison sites. Yeah. bit about Triodos itself. I mean, some people watching this might never have heard of Triodos. Actually, you've been around, I mean, you mentioned earlier, you've been around internationally for ages and in, in the UK for more than 25 years as well. Yeah. Yeah, the, the bank originally started in the Netherlands, uh, as I say, I think 1980 it was first incorporated. We operate in five European countries. We're in Germany, Belgium, Spain, and, and the UK, as well as the Netherlands. And we have about um, over 700,000 customers Europe-wide and around 90,000 in the UK. So um, so we're a significant sort of mid-sized bank now. Uh, and really, the model's very simple. You know, we, we have people who have their current accounts, savings, and ISAs, and so on with us. Uh, and we lend that out to projects that we think demonstrate positive environmental, social, cultural impact. Uh, and as I say, we let you be the judge of that by publishing online every loan uh, we make and so on. Um, uh, yeah, and um, uh, hopefully the bank has a, a, a long future into the, uh, the road ahead as well. Yeah, I, I, and I mean, I invest in your ISAs and okay, maybe more recently they've not done brilliant but then what investment has is well, that actually, that's the stocks and shares i said yeah yeah but they but, but the performance historically has been pretty impressive so it, it's it certainly didn't seem to me like a choice of invest in something that's good but get a poor return or you know invest in all sorts of <laughs> stuff you wouldn't want to be yeah. associated with and get a better return actually the return was pretty good 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, for stocks and shares ISIS, I mean, you're right, all stock markets globally have seen volatility and so on, but ours were very stable through the pandemic. And I, I, I think um, in that really stressed period, outperformed. I think since the Ukraine war, you've seen fossil fuels do very well. So some conventional portfolios are outperforming some sustainable portfolios. Yeah. But, uh, but I think we're trying to provide that curated sort of stable returns and performance more so than the traditional volatile funds. But uh, you also uh, just hinted at that kind of dilemma of trade-off sustainability versus financial reward. And it, 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 it's, it's something I always get asked about and, and uh, it challenges me. Because if you look at it at a product level, if you were to go and research who the two biggest fossil fuel banks are in the UK, our Cash ISA pays more than three times interest uh, of those two banks. So there's this conventional mindset, and then you think, but actually, does this bear out? Is the consumer getting more value from the high polluting industries? And the question almost needs to be turned on its head and say, you know, would you be happy with getting um, X amount more or, you know, 2% less for this kind of environmental impact? Uh, you know, we need to switch it around and always assume it's worse. Equally, there's been studies of banks globally and showed that the ones with the highest levels of uh, environmental social governance have generally outperformed. And that's a study of the world's top 60 most systemic banks. So, um, so I think there's a mindset that has to shift there. De definitely. I think as a, as a consumer, as an investor, I guess the question is, do you want to get the absolute maximum financial return no matter what the mm. consequences are for your kids, your grandkids for future generations? Or actually, do you want to put your money in something that's doing good for the world? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> whether, yeah. whether it makes a bit more or a bit less is sort of, yeah. surely that shouldn't be the, yeah. the, 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 the top question. Yeah, and, and you have more power than you think. You know, banks are quite sophisticated organisations. They're monitoring account closures and, you know, where people are moving to and everything else. And I... I think we need to awaken more the democratic power of money and every pound you choose to spend and save and invest, whether that's, you know, where you choose to get your internet uh, service provision or, or wherever it is, is a choice for the kind of the future planet you want to live in, really. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about a couple of general banking things. So scamming. So you, I've got this impression from certainly the comms that you send through, it's just this huge problem. Mm -hmm. And I think from all banks, it's just this huge problem, yeah. bank scams. So from a, the point of view of the CEO of a bank, I mean, what what's your view of the issue and, and, and what's the sort of level of resource that you need to deploy to try and fight this continual battle against people who are trying to rip your customers off and maybe rip you off? Yeah, it, look, it, it, uh, it's huge. And... Um, it is sadly a dark world out there, and there's a, it, you know, it, it, it's it's one of, if not the, it's one of the biggest sort of areas of crime in our society now is financial crime, and it is organised crime, and they are seeking to predate on people when they're unaware or predate on the most vulnerable um, uh, uh, people. So. You know, um, the, we, we are constantly putting out fraud awareness promotions and you can look on the triodos.co.uk website and find sort of details on how to protect yourself and things to be aware of and so on and really encourage um, people to do that. But um, it, it, what I find most hard is when the pandemic hit, that's when we see a real big spike in fraudulent attempts. They're looking for when people are distracted or when banks are distracted, because obviously, like everyone else, we were shifting everyone to home working and things like that. And that's when the fraudsters uh, are really um, at play. But uh, but you should be you know, always really wary of uh, of anything you get on your mobile phone that's a click through to something or telling you you've had a you know misdelivery on email or whatever, or whatever. Because unfortunately, it is it is rife and it's an everyday issue for everyone mm, yeah so the, the message is be uh yeah. be suspect of yeah and, uh, anything that comes through like and, that and like many organizations we're building in all the right protections so you know we, we'll never ask you you phone you and ask you for your personal details um uh, e equally you know you we've got two-factor authentication so you'll get a text message and code to put in for major transactions all, all these kind of things uh are trying to protect people but it, but it is a kind of arms race to keep mm. ahead of and obviously the economy is going this way, that way at the moment. So from, from your perspective, 
I know, I know you're restricted in some ways of what you can and can't say. But your your perspective on what you know the economy of in recent times, what would it be? Well, I, I, I guess I, I, I'm not that restricted. I just can't give advice or outlooks that people can um, you know uh, okay. put any credence to. But but ultimately. I think the economy now is um, is more stressed than it was after the financial crisis because that was a, a credit crisis which, you know, many people weren't borrowing at the time or didn't need a, a availability of that. We didn't have the high inflationary environment we have now. We didn't have the access to labour issues we have now. So I think we see across the board sectors that are really stressed and strained and some that you would never expect. So, you know, the, the care home sector, for example, has always been one that you thought with an ageing population population, this will always be a very sort of um, uh, solid sector. But unfortunately, you're seeing them really struggle to get staff, which means sometimes they're managing down the number of residents they have relative to the staff they can get. The staff are more expensive. Uh, so sometimes they're going to squeeze on revenues. Um, at the same time, food costs, heating costs, and everything's gone up. So, so the, that's them really worrying for society. What does that mean for the future of our care sector? And uh, and so we're seeing that across the board. So, uh, you know, I'd like to say um, that there's room for optimism. Um, we've seen in the news just today, actually coming here, that inflation figures are lower than predicted in the, in the latest round, but still very high, in excess of 7%. And, um, you know, you have to think this is a moment where we have to reinvent and rethink you know, our, our economy and, as I say, how we're measuring the success of our society because uh, you don't see this ending in a, in, in a good place, really. Mm. The levers we've historically always had to pull aren't working for us. I want to finish off with something completely different. <laughs> I want to talk about beavers. <laughs> and in particular, your book called River Journey, Searching for Wild Beavers and Finding Freedom. So check it out. It's uh, it's called River Journey, and it's by Tangent Books. Yeah. So there's the plug. Well, what's it all about, and how did you come to write it? Yeah, I'm getting quite used to the gear shift of talking about banking to beavers. Uh, but um, so earlier in my career, I was chief executive of, of uh, the Avon Wildlife Trust, and um, I was taking some time off from the bank a couple of years ago, and they asked me to investigate reports of a beaver on the River Avon. Uh, and so I got out on my kayak during this time off, which was funny enough during, you know, semi-lockdowns, so you couldn't travel, pubs and river hotels were shut. So I was taking a staycation, if you like. Um, but I, I, over a period of months, I managed to prove not just that there were, uh, was one beaver, there were several beavers, a whole family of beavers thriving and that they're successfully breeding uh, and had been there for several years. And this became a national news story. Um, and so I wrote a book about it. And it's partly sharing the adventure of being out on a river at dawn looking for beavers, which is just a beautiful thing to do. Um, it's partly a bit of species advocacy as to why beavers are really important to restoring our natural environment and, uh, and so on. And then it's also a story about nature and well-being. Um, and, uh, you know, it had a really positive effect on me. And, um, and I've thrown in thoughts on sustainability and a few of the things we've talked about today. That's it. Well, I look forward to reading it. I, I should say, Richard, all of the author proceeds go to charity. They go to the Beaver Trust and the Open Wildlife Trust. So if you do buy the book, then you're supporting conservation efforts. Fantastic. Very last thing. Uh, if anyone's watching this who isn't banking with Triodos, I'm a big advocate. What would you say to them to get them to sign up? Well, actually, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say bank with Triodos. I would say just make a real conscious decision about your banking and that it fits with your values. And so really think about what, what do you want from a bank in terms of its carbon footprint, about to what it does with the money in terms of the services you get and the quality of service and so on. So, uh, so just make it a conscious decision and not just about banking, but in everything you do and everything you buy in your life. So think about your internet service provider, you know, and think actually, does that satisfy me? Does that have a link to my values? And does that give me the quality of service I want as well? Because as I said earlier, every pound you invest, spend, save is a vote for the society and the future planet you want to live in. What a great way to finish. Bevis, thank you so much for joining me. And thank you very much for watching. Thanks, Richard.